Hey coaches, a somewhat emerging topic in running circles recently is on workout structure. Specifically, what, that one should be mixing different training intensities in a single workout versus training in just one zone on the day. An example in a cycling context might be starting with some sweet spot, but not as much as you would during a pure sweet spot workout, followed by some VO2 reps and ending with perhaps some low cadence, high gear, short hill sprints. Is someone shortchanging themselves by not dedicating the entirety of a workout to a specific zone? To restate your question, I think you're asking why would we dedicate an entire workout to a single energy system or a power level? And that's basically what's happening because power levels are just ranges of power that ideally target a particular energy system, even though there's going to be plenty of overlap. There, are, there always will be. Um, so the short answer is if the, the training stimulus or the adaptive signal isn't great enough, then the training adaptation is not going to take place or it'll be minimal. So both mixing of workout demands and isolating them makes sense just under different contexts. So the question then becomes, <clears throat> and it, it really just depends on the time of season, is, is the intent to minimize any interference effect? So you're basically focusing on a particular adaptation or adaptations, or is it to emulate race demands? Are you trying to put it all together, adaptations aside? So what, what, what do I mean by interference effect? Um, if we relate this back to strength versus endurance, and we've talked a number of times about this and how the two play or don't play well together, sometimes we put it in terms of mTOR versus AMPK, but you can see it even more simply if you just look at it as anabolic versus catabolic. You know, are we trying to build muscle or are we trying to break down energy stores? Those are two very different signals, and we can't send them at once and expect the body to respond in two different ways. So this discussion with mTOR and AMPK is, is a quintessential example of the interference interference effect and that's it down at the signaling level so let's instead take a higher view and look at the muscle fibers and do note that this translates to so many other systems in the body cardiovascular the cardiopulmonary respiratory uh or like like the organelles within each muscle fiber the enzymes the proteins so it has systemic effects but we're going to look narrowly at the muscles so pretty simply or basically we we need to establish a foundation for each energy system and to effectively establish it requires focus. We need to minimize interference as much as possible. So this brings us to a couple takeaways already. First, establishment of an energy system's capabilities requires greater focus than maintaining it. And we've talked about how easy it is to maintain it, relatively speaking. Second takeaway is that certain effects run counter to other effects. And, and when you mix these training signals or stimuli, you just don't deliver enough challenge to any one energy system to bring about the adaptation you're looking for. It's simply too dilute. So let me give you three examples of unfavorable mixed training. This is basically energy systems that don't play nice together. So if you were to do sprints before anaerobic power repeats, they're too similar in terms of fiber recruitment. And that means the height of the anaerobic work that comes after the sprints is gonna to be too blunted because the, the muscles are too cooked. And that workload is going to shift to the wrong or really lower level muscle fibers. And the high force that you're targeting won't be addressed, at least not as well as it could be. Another example would be if you combine VO2 max work with aerobic endurance work in between the efforts instead of full recovery. So for instance, you ride at 60% between these VO2 repeats instead of 50 or 40. And what happens is... <laughs> Sounds like a yeah, worse nightmare, by the way. <laughs> like, yeah, it, in between your VO2 max intervals, right at 60%. Oh my gosh, I'd die. And that's, that's really why you won't see that workout out there too. Because the, the VO2 quality or really the breathing stress, this, this sought after uh, heightened oxygen consumption, and therefore the adaptive stimulus that we're targeting falls off fast and hard, interval after interval after interval. So again, not a productive combination. And then finally, long, slow distance are really just long bouts of aerobic endurance, 60% sort of stuff before muscle endurance, which is, you know, sweet spot or, or threshold training. The, the sweet spot training or the muscle endurance training has a hefty aerobic component. So if you cook those fibers prior to doing, to, to, to targeting those fibers, you're in for a miserable and probably less productive a sweet spot workout or threshold mm -hmm. workout because the accumulated fatigue is going to impact the quality of that harder work. It's, it's kind of like, it's very akin to actually going into a workout low on sugar or running out sugar in the midst of a sweet spot workout. You just don't have the gas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are unfavorable mixed training. So let's look at the other side of that, which is the, the complementary effects. In this case, we're minimizing the interference by mixing what I refer to as play nice energy systems. So yes, there is some interference 
you know, we're not targeting any one thing in particular, but they actually work pretty well together. One example is sprints during an aerobic endurance ride. And the beauty of these is that they can be done at different points all along the ride. If you do them at the end, you're, you're kind of targeting fatigue across fiber types. You've, you've done the long slow work, so you've already cooked the slow twitch fibers. Now you're gonna hit the fast twitch fibers, call it a day. If you do them at the beginning, you can benefit from not only fresh muscles, which probably means better sprints, but it also lives, uh, can, can include something called nerve potentiation, which really simply is just stronger nerve impulses in the nerves that you previously used. So effectively, the, the nervous system is working better because you woke it up. And then if you do them in the middle, you know, it's just kind of a, a, a bit of both, right? But in all cases, you get a race or event specificity and, and all sorts of learning opportunities. Figure stuff out. When the sprints work for you, how hard is too hard, how many can I do, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of information to be gleaned. Uh, another example will be VO2 max work with steady state work instead of recovery. Though the recovery comes eventually. So basically what I'm talking about are those reduced amplitude bill outs where you work at 120 and you recover. You don't recover, but you, you float at 88%. And the benefit there is with, with this particular combination is you get a really high level of oxygen, oxygen consumption and it stays high over the course of that entire interval. Much higher than it would if you were to recover, if you were to do two minutes on, three minutes on and then take a two or three minute rest. Not to mention these two can be really event specific and that's why you'll see these largely in the specialty plans, maybe entirely. And then final example would be doing aerobic endurance after muscle endurance. So like uh, doing, doing a sweet spot workout followed by 30 minutes riding at 60%. And this is a popular combination. And, and with it, the, the muscle endurance isn't likely enough or isn't likely to thoroughly stress your more aerobic fibers, your slow switch fibers. And this leaves them less fatigued and is insufficiently stimulated. Meaning that the training stimulus didn't reach a level where it inspired adaptation in those particular fibers. So you add on some extra low intensity work and you address those fibers when you're already partway there. So the big takeaway here is that mixing the workout demands can be done effectively, but it's never going to be as concentrated as isolating them. But that's totally okay because training gradually shifts from establishment to race specificity as we move closer to our events. To, to put it another way, we're favoring application over acquisition. We effectively acquire, then we can apply these well-developed capabilities. Right, I think we, we were talking about this before. We had the, the analogy was, if you're forging and then sharpening a blade, there's a difference mm -hmm. between forging the blade, sharpening the blade, and then there's a difference between those two things and actually using the blade. And so it's, when you're, when you're building out this, these, each of these systems, that's the forging of the blade. And then as you, you kind of create them in combinations, that's the sharpening. And then when you're actually on race day, that's when you're applying Utilize. everything that you've created and sharpened. Exactly. Uh, there are examples of this too, like in the workout catalog with trainer road, I'm thinking of like Baird plus six, for example, where you'll be doing VO two max intervals. And then after the VO two max intervals are done, you'll recover plenty between those. It'll be low intensity, but then after those are done, you'll carry on with some 60% work for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. and there, there are other examples too, where, where it's, where it's utilized like this all well, throughout. This, this whole uh, level of organization and this, this movement through the, 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 trainer roads build based specialty cycle is actually a really good demonstration of everything I just talked about. So let me run through that pretty quickly. If you look at sweet spot, sweet spot base one, it sticks super closely to just muscle endurance work. There's very little else because we're isolating and targeting the, the muscle endurance or the strength endurance. So minimizing interference. Then you get to sweet spot two and we start, to, I, I start to weave in mixed demand workouts and they'll happen in each week and they'll even happen in some workouts where the demands with, with, within the workout are a little bit varied, complementary ideally. Mm -hmm. And then you, if you take a look at sweet spot based high volume, this, isn't, this is an exception though, because this is an example of targeting high level muscle endurance. We're trying to avoid all possible interference effects. Reason being is some riders have really high levels of muscle endurance, or they know from past experience that they have, they can accommodate high levels of muscle endurance work and they need a more concentrated stream, uh, training stimulus. It, stimulus. And Brandon is the perfect example of this. I mean, he buried himself for four weeks, worked out diligently, and it yielded a lot. So he's obviously got a high tolerance for certain kinds of work. We're going to have to figure out, he's going to have to figure out how to change that so that he can get even more powerful, even faster. 
Then when you move to the build plans, these are actually a really good demonstration of that gradual shift I'm talking about where you minimize, where minimizing of interference has to start balancing with your more race specific or event specific demands. And if you look at the short and sustained builds, these remain a bit more focused because their end games, their events are a little more focused in terms of the relied upon energy systems. Whereas with general build, it's more mixed because overall improvement is more important than emphasizing short power over sustained power or vice versa. And then finally, it went, once you get to the specialty plans, this is where you'll see all sorts of variants or varied degrees of uh, this mixed energy system contribution. And the road specialties in particular encapsulate this perfectly. Rolling road race, you'll see almost every imaginable combo. Some play nice combos, but also some products of how complex rolling road races are and maybe not ideal in adaptive effect, but really applicable in terms of race or actual racing. Climbing road race, a little less varied, so slightly fewer combo workouts. Crit, you'll see at least two play nice energy system combinations in every single workout. And then a mixed bag workout where I throw everything at you because that's what races do. That's what criteriums do. And finally, time trials. And, and that's all muscle endurance because time trialing. I mean, you, you either work a little above, a little below, a little right at FTP, but time trial specialists are very unidimensional. So they can remain highly focused. They, they have a very little level of interference effects, but they're also li limited in terms of their capability. They do, they do one thing really well, but everything else isn't a concern. So that's okay. A lot of temptation probably exists for a person to just train a little bit of everything every day. But the main reason that you don't want to do that is because in order to make the improvements you want, you really have to stress things significantly and specifically, right? And specific yeah. energy systems to do so. Yeah, you'll quickly reach a point where all those things are basically as good as they're going to get because you're not heaping any extra demand on any of them. Right. Two, two analogies that I have on this is one, you see this in weight training a lot where people will do full body workouts. They'll get to a certain point and then they're like, actually, I need to move to a push pull legs kind of thing or really hit a certain body part with more volume in order for it to grow. And I think that happens the same, exactly what we were saying in cycling, Chad. And yeah. two, you also see this with people who do a lot of group rides. Uh, they get tired, but they don't necessarily get more fit, right? At first they get more yeah. fit and then they come join us. They get just as tired, but because they're doing structure and really hitting those energy systems, they get to a whole new level. Um, yeah, perfect. And that's, that's, that's something too that happens to a lot of people. Like you think, oh, if I'm just really tired, I'm, I'm getting faster, which isn't always the case. This is, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of people that don't do structured training, they always get their butt kicked by that one climb or it's always hard to do that one specific thing in, in any sort of ride. And it's because you aren't stressing the energy systems that define success in that specific moment. And that's, <clears throat> so like a lot of people, mountain bikers in particular, I'm thinking of, <clears throat> forgive me. They're like, oh man, I like, they, they do their normal Saturday ride and there's that one climb on that Saturday and it's super hard. And whatever the profile is like, you can train the energy systems that are utilized on that sort of profile. But because they don't, and if they just ride more, it's tougher to actually get faster at it. You're getting specificity, but you're not actually building the sort of things that are going to make you successful in that specific moment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like, you know, if you watch any sort of like, uh, if, you, if you are into blacksmithing or anything else like that, and you watch any blacksmith work, they don't... <laughs> It's actually fascinating. Nate's looking sideways. It's fascinating, man. Blacksmithing is super cool. Let me watch um, this. Am I am I making myself a nerd here? Go onto YouTube few, and look at a few hours a night. Yeah. Every night. Just watch people. Bam, bam, bam. Hey, you've got a you've got a TikTok addiction, so you can't talk very much here. So but don't compare I'll, my TikTok to blacksmithing. It's I fascinating. I don't even know. The point is they don't bother with sharpening anything until the very, very end. Like very, very end. So when you're just try thinking that, well, if I just repeat something and just do something over and over, I'll get better at that. Yes, you will get better within a very tight realm of, 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 of improvement, so to speak. If you want to expand that and actually truly improve your capabilities, you can't just repeat the same thing. You have to focus on the very things that define success in that moment, which is that's why we do structured training. <clears throat> I've often thought that people might get like, you can get lucky with how fast you can get depending on what your terrain is like. Like if you had a course that had maybe three minute climbs with three minute descents and like, like you could do five of those. And then you had another course where you had like a 20 minute climb and a five minute descent, and a 20 minute climb. And you could just kind of randomly build in like 
threshold workouts, sweet spot workouts, and VO2 max workouts because your climbs were just the right amount of time that it took you. But as you get faster, then the time changes. Rather than how most of us do is you, it's, it's very sporadic, right? And it's, you're going really hard for a second and then you're not easy, then you go a long climb. And you know, it's just, a, it's kind of what you're saying, Chad, a kitchen sink workout mm -hmm. uh, that happens. Um, but I, I bet there's somebody out there somewhere that has just the perfect terrain and they're just naturally doing structural training. Spaces. Yeah, on accident, right? It's got. It's, it has to have happened to somebody. Yeah. So, something to add to that, though, is that you know, properly structured training also is progressive, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so even though you may be doing something that's like a certain set of intervals, that's like doing the same workout every single day and expecting yeah. an improvement yeah. beyond that. Yeah, the time gets shorter yeah. because the hill gets less time because you go up faster. That too, right? So, and what you really need if you're talking about you know structured training is you need to spend more time and or shrink those rests one of the two uh, or change up the structure in one way or another to change the stimulus to bump that needle up so yep. and and i i do want to use this topic to to caution a certain maybe even pick on a bit a certain subset of riders or coaches that i see this happen on coaching platforms with coaches with riders with cherry pickers of workouts where they make workouts hard just for the sake of being hard and it, it it's a tough thing for me to stomach as a coach and just a, an analytic bike rider because it's not effective training. Not, not usually, maybe not ever. And to go back to the, the blade analogy, you're, you're forging a weak blade. Mm -hmm. It never gets sharp and it sucks in battle. You, you can't utilize it. It's just not good at anything. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.